Hey guys, I just made it inside the Baltimore, this weird government secured, highly secured facility. Uh, inside this deep, deep basement, there's pools of green water everywhere. It's like a swamp down here, man. Did you hear that? What? <gasps> Hey guys, welcome to Rasweiler Sound. I'm Jamie Rasweiler here with Nathan Robitaille, the supervising sound editor on The Shape of Water. In this talk, we chat about character development through sound, sound design, and voice acting challenges throughout the production of the film, and how to improve your sound design chops. So, let's get to it. Hey man, how's it going? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. So in the beginning of the film, we enter through Giles' apartment with Eliza. What can you tell me about this particular scene that changes the audience's perception of Giles? The character Giles, and this was this was baked into the script, and, and I kind of noticed, this is one of the first things that I kind of noticed about his character. He has all these cats in his apartment. And, I mean, if you watch the scene, you don't really see a ton of cats. You just, you hear them. And what that kind of does is it kind of, it sort of manipulates the audience into investing their opinion into Giles because, you know, you'll have, I think anybody, you know, when, when you hear about somebody who has a lot of cats, you know, you, 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 you have an opinion about that and everybody has an opinion about people who have too many cats. Yeah. And so I was reading the script and, and I think it pulled it off. To me, it seemed like, you know, he was just this, uh, this really sweet, loving, nurturing type. And maybe somebody who hates cats won't feel that way. Maybe they'll think that he's a, he's a hoarder or something weird like that. But, you know, regardless, we get to tell the audience something about Giles' character without wasting any time in the cut. And I have to say that was also, that wasn't, um, uh, that the, the execution of those cats, I have to give credit to Tyler Woodham who was okay. one of the sound effects editors on the, on the movie with mm -hmm. me. So yeah, and he, uh, I think he did a, a bang up job. So throughout the film, we realized pretty early on that Eliza is a mute character. As part of the sound team, how did you make her seem interesting to the audience without any dialogue? Well, I, I, I certainly can't take credit for saying that, for making her interesting. If you want to look at it mm -hmm. in terms of adding, adding depth to her character, when we cut out of Giles' apartment, for example, um, she's walking down the hall and, uh, one of the things, one of the things that we were asked for by Guillermo was, you know, let's, let's get tap shoes. And it wasn't immediately apparent what he was going for, but what the, the process revealed was that, you know, he just, he kind of wanted to show that Eliza had music in her heart, that she was, she was mute, but she wasn't meek or shy. She was confident she had, you know. She had dance in her. And I think that's kind of what tied it all together, was bringing in an actual tap dancer, because then when you're doing those moves, at least you have the dance nuances mm -hmm. of a tap dancer, and so you wind up hearing these, these tap shoes, and, and it kind of suggests a little bit more about yeah. Eliza. She knows all of the moves to her favorite tap dances. So speaking about Eliza, let's speak about her love interest. The Fishman. I think it's a very interesting dynamic. But as part of the sound team, what were some steps that you took to help adapt the overall audience to have them be comfortable with this love story? I would say the, in the first scene that Eliza meets the creature, that's the first time that we really get to meet the creature ourselves as the audience, yeah. right? Like that's when his, his eyes first come out of the water and, and we don't know who he is. We don't know what kind of animal this is. We certainly don't expect it to become a love interest. But, you know, in the movie, we had to get it there. As the creature approaches, you notice kind of like a bit of an arc just in that one scene um, from when we first reveal the creature over the surface of the water and he's making these cute chirps. And you're not really sure, you know, what to what to think of this, this animal. And then he comes closer. And as he stands up out of the water, he has this big sort of intimidating inhale, this, this kind of you know, almost lion-like, it's a very strong presence. And, and I think that as he's standing up, you start to realize, okay, whoa, he could probably do damage. And one of the ways I like to think about that scene is he reveals himself kind of like a Bengal tiger, this beautiful, 
absolutely enchanting looking creature, but it could kill you. That scene, it's not a long scene, but you know, you, you, we, we cover a lot of ground there. We go from like, oh, he's a cute little creature. He could, he could hurt me yeah. to, oh no, he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's scared of his own shadow. And we kind of have to follow Eliza in, in her journey to invite him into her life and to, you know, to earn his trust more than the other way around. You know what I mean? Like you kind of think of this as a caged animal. You don't think of it in terms of earning its trust. You kind of want to just protect yourself. But he, he quickly reveals himself not to be something that you need to protect yourself from. Mm. So a little fish told me that you did some voice acting for the fish man. Would you mind showing us what you did to create one of his many voice layers? Oh my god. <laughs> when you inhale, uh, like if you're if you're gasping for air, you know, <gasps> right? But then choke that off a little bit and you get <gasps> and then if you go <gasps> right? And then you can kind of start creating these glottal stops where you just cut the air off to the the sound you're making. Think about the word like uh, yeah. uh, 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 uh. When you do that, you kind of, you're kind of cutting off the air as you pass it through your vocal cords. You can do the same thing on an inhale. And so you can get like, a, uh, 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 right? But then if you can speed that up a bit, then you wind up with like, So that's kind of, that That was the base, but, you know, that's only one part of his voice. Yeah. And Guillermo came in and did the same thing. Mm. And he did a breath pass, and he was able to give us some really cool, deeper, more guttural breaths and things. Mm. Like for the bathtub sequence, when they revive the fish man, when they first get him home, most of that struggle, like in, in that scene, my stuff was maybe like an accent to what Guillermo mm. did. So it was a big mix. There's a scene where uh, Eliza first offers the fish man an egg. It's the record player scene. Mm. So for a creature like this, you kind of have to approach your job as a sound designer as though you're part of an actor. Because like I'm on the hook not to mess up the amazing performance that Doug Jones did, right? Like he, he really brought it. Those are big shoes to fill. Like honestly, I was just kind of throwing it at the wall to see if it would stick. We were also auditioning voice actors, trying to figure out what he should sound like. And just to give it a shot, I took that little scene and I sent it off and they loved it. Like they absolutely loved that scene. I was over the moon to get that, that kind of praise. I think that they looked at that and they thought, okay, that sounds great. This is fantastic. Keep doing exactly that. Here's another scene. And the scene that showed up was the torture scene. The torture scene got edited and re-edited, not picture-wise, sound-wise. I think I had to redo that scene like three or four different times. Hmm. So why did you have to do so many different edits? Well, I had to redo it so many times because I, I, I thought like, okay, so Strickland comes in, the, the creature is angry, right? He's chained to a plinth, Eliza's running behind the, the rack of equipment. The monster's angry at Strickland, and he's like, he's being strong, and he's like, you know, go save yourself, I'll... Yeah. I, I kind of just misread the scene the first time. The next time I approached, I remember like, I, so I sent that, and he's like, eh, no, it's, it's, it's lacking dimension. They may have been picking up on what I was trying to do, but it wasn't pulling off what Guillermo wanted done. Guillermo basically sat down with me and, and said like, listen, what it's missing is vocabulary. What gives? <laughs> I remember saying to him, you know, well, it's, it's not there now, but it, it is coming. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, well, if not now, when? Because if not you, who? And, and at first, I think I felt a little, I felt a little sinking feeling when he said that, which I think is natural. But it didn't take long for me to realize that, okay, you know what? He wouldn't have said that to somebody he didn't think he could accomplish what he wanted pulled off. He was being hard on me because he knew I could do it. He had seen some other work that I had done and he, he knew it was in there. He just had to push for it, and he yeah. pushed. And I think he got what he wanted in the end, which I'm extremely proud of. I, I, and, and I have to say, I think I'm more proud of that scene than the first one, despite the, the early success. 
it's because of the fight, you know? Like, yeah. I, had to, I had to fight. I had to dig deeper, and I had to find more expressive tonality in that strange sound that I made with my voice um, than I brought to the table initially. And I find that, um, I find that interesting, you know, because there you have this uh, flawless performance from Doug Jones, and I got to add a layer of icing to it that helped the audience understand in more detail what ultimately Guillermo wanted to express. In one of the early meetings, we talked about how the longer he spends out of water, he needs to sound like he's drying out because that's a story point. Like it becomes a problem for him when he's been out of the tub for too long. And uh, I took one of those, you know, those hot water bottles that you put in your bed in the wintertime to keep your feet warm? <laughs> the, the granny bottles? I took one of those, just those rubber bla water bladders, and I cut the corner off of it and I filled it with a little bit of water. And then I would manipulate the shape of it while breathing through it. So that was my half of it. And the other half was in the guys at Foley One, Pete Prasad and Steve Bain. For the physical movement of his gills, he took some quarter inch tape and maybe a wet face cloth and some quarter inch tape just to give it that sort of scaly movement. And then like, I, I, he, he used some Foley black magic voodoo to make those gills sound right, man. And uh, yeah, when everything sunk up, it sounded like it looked. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, for this interview. One last question for everyone listening. Could you give us some steps that you would recommend to help us move forward in the field? Design sound. Grab a recorder. Go and record that box of cereal. Go and record that water bladder. Find ways to perform the world around you like they're your musical instrument. If you have particularly interesting sounding gravel in a pit somewhere in your backyard and you think you can make cool sounds out of it, get back there. You know, learn how to record in a noisy environment. Learn how to comb out that noise. Well, I highly recommend Isotope. If you start to build a library, if you start to record things, and you start to make things, you start to learn how much you can do with those things. And further to that, if uh, maybe you're crunched for time and you can't record as much as you want to, I take it back. I think my biggest piece of advice to anybody who wants to be a sound designer is go and watch movies. Get your butt into a theater, you know. Listen to what the people are doing who you, whose work you admire and who you look up to. Expose yourself. Expose yourself to the art form that you want to excel at. You know, you want to be a painter, go to a lot of museums. Same with a sculptor. If you want to be an actor, go to, go to Broadway and watch a lot of plays, I think, you know. Um, but if you want to be a sound designer, yeah, you just you need to listen to sound design and you need to make some. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nathan, for this great interview. This has been Jamie Rossweiler with Nathan Robitaille. I hope you all enjoyed and learned some cool things. And if you guys have any ideas for future videos, please comment down below. I'll see you guys shortly. Feel free to message me on Instagram or email. Cheers. Cheers.